more people participating, hopefully. Um, I, just a couple of kind of ground rules, um, except for the presenters, which it, we'll go through who those are, but um, if you could put your uh, microphones on mute, unless you're gonna ask a question. Um, the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna go through each of the kind of sections in the agenda. And then at the end of the sections, we'll ask, uh, open it up for questions so anybody can, can do that. Um, I don't believe you can type in questions in a chat. I think there is a way to hold up your hand, but I don't know how to do that. It says raise hand if you want. Um, the last thing is, is we want you guys to have fun. Um, I, I noticed uh, several of you already have your favorite beverage. Um, I don't know why Glenn has a beer and Debbie doesn't, but everybody else seems to be. Yeah, I do. Oh, we got it right here. <laughs> <laughs> we got it covered. Um, everybody should be having a beer and, or whatever you want to drink mm -hmm. and uh, sit back and have fun. Is, is yes, the um, PowerPoint presentation. That should yep. be your main screen. Got it. Copy that. All right. Great. Um, if you all can see your PowerPoint, well, that's what we'll go through. But it's it's mostly um, pictures of boat porn. So um, if you miss it, don't worry too much. So we're we're really lucky that our club has gotten um, you know four people, really five if you include uh, Charlotte and John, but they couldn't be here. Um, that have bought um, large cruising boats over the last year. So we have lots of experience on what it takes to do that, what it means. So we've got Glenn Kimball who closed last Monday on Stargazer, which is a hunter. Is it a 43 or 44? I can't uh, remember. 44 Dexalon, 2006. Okay. And then Patrice Moon um, bought a, I'm gonna let you jump in Patrice. You're muted. Patrice, you don't, shouldn't be muted. <laughs> Sorry. I, I bought a Pacific Seacraft 37 um, in 1982. And and it's also considered, what, what's the designer? I can't remember, Creelock 37? Yeah, uh, Creelock designed it. So sometimes it's known as a Creelock 37. Pam and, and Chris just bought a uh, Morgan 44. And Carl and Linda, you have a, is it a 43 or 44 foot Genoa? Uh, Genoa 42. 42, okay. And you'll see some pictures of my boat too. I bought a, about four years ago, a 44 foot um, Daler as well, which is That's for what sale. started this madness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Right. Everything's for sale. So our agenda, um, and what we're gonna try to go through is, the first thing is determining the right type of boat. What are you mm -hmm. looking for? Because there's a lot of boats that meet different people's needs. Um, so we're gonna talk about how did you decide what type of boat? And like, um, I know Patrice looked at several different boats that all kind of fit that same mold. I don't know if the others all did as well. Um, but finding the right type of boat, then once you narrow down your type of boat you want, finding the perfect boat. Um, because, um, and I think uh, Chris and, and Pam will talk a little bit about finding a two or three Morgan 44s that may not have been what they really wanted before they found the perfect one. Um, then we're gonna talk about negotiating the purchase, uh, getting a survey, uh, budgeting for the long term. Um, as we all know, buying a boat is one thing, but budgeting so that you um, have enough money to keep it is something I certainly don't know how to do. That's why my boat's for sale. <laughs> oh, Mike. And then finding a home for your boat, um, where you're going to keep it. So those are the things we'll go through. So we're going to just start with finding the right model. And I'm going to ask uh, Patrice, why don't you talk to us a little bit about how you went about doing that? 
Well, I feel like Chris and I spent a lot of time. We <laughs> 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 have to attest to this. <laughs> She's like, oh my gosh, you two are killing me. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, for me, I had, um, I feel like specific things that I wanted. I didn't want to get a boat that was um, more than I really thought that I could handle. And even with a 37, I feel like, you know, moving up from my 26 to a 37, I felt like it was a good jump. I really, um, I'm kind of fascinated with people that live in, in tiny homes and tiny spaces. And really what brought me to Pacific Seacraft was watching some different um, blogs and um, people that have traveled the world on a Pacific Seacraft 31. I mean, they really have some um, unique boats. And so that's really what I was drawn to the Pacific Seacraft for, um, really looking at even smaller boats than the 37. I really um, had had my eye on a 31 or possibly a 34, um, not really thinking of a 37. So that, I don't know, that was just something that I was really interested in and looking for something that's really seaworthy. Um, and I felt like the safety was there for me personally. So, but I, I won't lie, Chris actually found this boat. <laughs> so what other, what other boats did you look at? Um, I mean, I, I used to just keep a running list on my phone of like, I had it my boats I love this list. Um, when I narrowed it down, I was looking at a K3, I want to say, it was a 30, 30, 34. Um, I did look at an island pack, 32 or 34. Can I get folks that are craft in a 37? Uh, um, we're getting real bad echoes. Let's see, does that help? That helps. Is yeah. that better? Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so when I narrowed it down, those were kind of the four boats that I was really looking closely at. And, um, but I kind of knew when I got on this 37, I just kind of fell in love with it. But Pam knows that's, I, I love, I love old boats. <laughs> so as soon as I got on that, I was like, oh, I know this is probably going to be the demise of me, but I fell in love with her. So. <laughs> and I, I probably have, um, the absolute opposite style boat. So my boat, um, mm -hmm. you know, what I was really going for was not so much a blue water boat, which um, the Pacific Seacraft is definitely a blue water boat. I think the Morgan 44 is a blue water boat. I was looking for something to do island hopping primarily in the Caribbean, but I also wanted to do the races down there. So I bought an extremely fast um, cruising boat and really put emphasis on speed. Um, the downside to it, it has a seven foot three keel or draft, which means I can't really take it very many places in Florida or the Bahamas. Um, Carl and Lisa, do you wanna talk a little bit about how you chose the type of boat you wanted? Well, um, well we, we knew that we wanted a, a when we first moved down to Florida, we weren't sure whether we were going to work and and then find a part-time, you know, live aboard boat, you know, try and ease ourselves into it. Um, but about three months into it down there, we we just we looked at a we looked at several boats. And then when we found this boat, we decided, you know, we could do this and we're gonna live aboard. So we knew that eventually we, we would want to live aboard. Um, I know a lot of people you know, keep a home and, you know, they store their boat or they keep it in a marina, but we kind of went all in. So that was a big consideration for us. And, you know, the things that we thought were really important, you know, Carl's six, four. Uh, so we needed one that he wouldn't have to walk around like this all the whole time. Walked through a Benetel 42 center cockpit and I was crunched over <laughs> all the way through oh, it. Wow. And he absolutely loved it. And, and that, I was like, you know, yeah, we love this boat, but you'll be, you know, that could do permanent damage. You can't walk around like this forever because that's our house and that's our home. So, well, you know. Carl we, and I had that problem too. Yeah. yeah so that, that was key. <laughs> that was a key. Um, you know, we had, I know, yeah. Um, we also, 
the interior, what we thought, it's interesting because what we thought was a very, very important now, you know, 18 months into it, we realize, you know, that we should have focused somewhere else, but you don't know until you buy a boat and mm -hmm. live on a boat. It's really hard to determine what you want in Liveaboard. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a great, we, we chose a very um, well-known boat. We, we did want the draft keel, like you said, uh, Mike, so that we could do what we want to do. We, we knew we'd be doing the ICW the first year for sure with some offshore sailing because, again, we're new to this. Yeah. Yeah, we we were we moved to Tampa to get that blue water, you know, offshore experience, and then basically the whole first year was our blue water experience. Yeah, be careful if you're thinking about it because you might fall into it quicker than you think yeah. occasionally, and that's what happened. To us. Three months in, we bought a boat, and five months in, we were on it full time. Yeah, and gone and headed to the Keys. So, so Glenn, why don't you talk to us a little bit about? Um, picking a boat based on age and, and amount of work that needed to be done because you you um, picked a much newer boat than most of the other folks. And talk to me a little bit about that. Well, um, it actually started out with me looking at a 1975 Sparks and Stevens one design, uh, one up, <laughs> that needed a tremendous amount of work um, and wouldn't have been in the water for quite some time. And uh, fortunately, I have a wonderful wife who brought me back to reality on it because we quite were frankly, not a fixer up a boat. We've already done that with the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so we uh, we shifted gears, and we're familiar with hunters. I'm I'm familiar with. I, I wanted to stick with a mainstream uh, model that uh, we we'd easily find parts in, and we actually ended up in in a situation where we fell in love with an area, uh, Rock Hall. Uh, Maryland um, and that destination was more of a driver than the the boat type initially um, because I've never sailed the Chesapeake and I've been up in the Northeast uh, I've, I've done the sound I've been off the coast uh, Newburyport Nantucket I've been Cuddy Hunk you know those those areas that Carl was not too long ago visiting <laughs> yeah, we it awesome to watch <laughs> um, but we also wanted to, the boat that we wanted to have, we wanted to have um, a good amount of space and comfort. And we were looking at some 460s. Uh, we were looking at um, some, you know, some other similar uh, hunters in the area. And, uh, but one of the things we, we found out about was um, having a char this is actually a charter boat, believe it or not. Um, and uh, I know we're going to talk about financing and, and funding for the future, so I won't get into that. But uh, this happened to be in the right place with the right features that we wanted. And uh, the, the pricing was where we needed it. And uh, it turns out that this is possibly the most well-maintained boat in the area. It's just it's, it's incredibly uh, well taken care of. And so the, uh, the survey came back. Uh, extremely well which again we'll talk about later but yeah so we landed in this particular boat you're looking at it now that's gamble is its name now it will be stargazer in the near future so um chris and pam any any additions to this section oh boy <laughs> um so yeah finding the right boat it this started the uh, for me personally, this started many years ago. I've been, when I get into something, I go in all the way and, and uh, I got quite enamored with sailboats. And um, yeah, my, my uh, needs and, and wants changed many, many, many times until the point where it started to become more of a reality then and and I got serious about it and then I started to research more and more and more and more at that point so I'd already done a ton of research um, I uh, I decided that I wanted something if I was going to live on board the boat I wanted something that I could be very comfortable um, at anchor and and uh, and also a boat that sails well, which is everything in this process is a compromise all the time. Um, but finding the best compromise is really what you're looking for when you're looking for your boat that goes over the horizon with you in it. So um, 
a couple of years ago, Pam and I went out to Florida and we were, it was just kind of a, just kind of a, um, a, a looky loo trip. We just, we called a broker on a couple of boats. I think one was a Tartan 40. Um, there was a couple of others that I don't recall. And, and then there was one that we weren't even expecting that we went and looked at. And, and, uh, that's, that's a real important thing is when you think you know the right boat or have the right boat in your mind, you need to go look at one and decide because like I thought the Tartan 37 was to me for a long time was a fabulous, they're beautiful boats. And, um, the, the aesthetics of the boat gets my attention first, naturally. Um, but, uh, when I looked at the Tartan 40, the Tartans were, there were very small boats internally. Um, the, it wasn't, it didn't look to me like a good liveaboard at all. And then this, uh, the, um, broker had suggested that we go look at this boat down in Marco Island. We were in, I think Tampa, St. Pete looking at some boats. So we ran down there and we, we went to go look at it. It was a Brewer 12.8, which I'd actually, because of all my time of surfing on the internet, looking at boats, um, at the time I, I, I'd seen the boat on the internet, the boat. And after I looked at this boat, it was fabulous. It was immaculate. Perfect. It was a 1988 boat. And, but it was, it was a, so Brewer 12.8 is a, is a, uh, 42 foot center cockpit, center cockpit boat. Um, like it's, it's a, it's a knockoff of the Whitby 42, but it's got some enhancements to the hull to make it faster and not being ready to buy. It was like, Whoa, wow. That was the boat. That was the boat. And it was fabulous. And, uh, I, I kind of waffled on it for a week, and by the time I called back about it, it had already sold. But I decided then and there that, that if I was patient enough, I could find a boat that was in good enough condition that I could go to sea on it without having to do a major refit. Because if I had the time, I, there was there's many boats, and and um, Glenn talks about the Sparkman Stevens designs. There's so many boats out of the 70s and and uh, 80s that are just fabulous boats they just need complete rebuild from the bottom up and i don't have i don't have that kind of time i don't have 2 years to throw into a complete rebuild so i knew that i was wanting to find a boat that was in if it was an older boat and that's basically what i was looking at in my price range is what i could afford it has to be in very good condition they're out there they're few and far between. So um, the I wasn't uh, the center cockpit was a, a design that was on my short list because of the engine space below the cockpit. I'm an aircraft mechanic and I know what it is like to crawl around in very tight places working on narrow body airplanes versus not so tight places working on wide body airplanes. So. I preferred the center cockpit because it's got a larger engine room compartment for your systems to be housed. Whereas the aft cockpit design, unless you go over 50 foot, the, the engine room compartment and the accessory compartment is quite cramped. And I didn't want to do that. Plus I like the aft deck space on a center cockpit boat. Um, so that played a lot into my, uh, what kind of a boat I desired. Um, so on my short list, uh, I would probably see the Passport 40 for an aft cockpit design started to um, make it to the top of the list. That was a, um, that had looked, I think I'd looked at one Passport 40. It was older, not in that good a shape, but it was, I liked the layout and the cockpit was a very nice cockpit. Um, but as you probably know, those Passport 40s were all built in Taiwan and they originally had teak decks. So if you're looking at a boat um, from built in the 80s, chances are the deck needs to be replaced and there's gonna be a lot of damage in the core, in the, um, in the, the main deck below it because of the leaking screws. And that's just the fact with a teak deck boat from that generation. Newer teak decks on the newer boats, 
it's just a laminate and it's basically bonded to the deck of the boat. So it's, there's far less damage you have to worry about with the newer boat, with the teak deck. Um, you know, um, the uh, Beneteau 42 um, center cockpit was also kind of at the top of the list. And, um, but that was at the top of my price point too. Um, another boat I started to look at quite a bit was the uh, Gulf Star 44. It, it um, in a lot of the articles had a really good write up as far as the, how they were built. But when I started to look at a lot of Gulf Stars, they were not in very good condition. Although I did find one after I bought the Morgan 44 that was in very good condition. Not that I was unhappy with Morgan. So when we found this Morgan 44, it had, um, I had, I had seen it. I had a broker down in Kima that was actually reaching out for me, looking for boats and, and, uh, this Morgan came up and I would contact him and say, Hey, reach out to this guy, see what you think. And he came back and said, Oh yeah, it's already sold. And, uh, it, it looked really clean on, on, uh, on uh, yacht world. And, um, so, I was like, I took that off the list, but then I was looking again a couple of months later and the thing popped up again. And I was like, well, I remember that boat, but I remember it being off the, off the market. So I called on it. Um, it had already been, uh, had a contract, but the contract was running out because the guy couldn't come up with funding, which is what you're going to run into with older boats. Those are going to be a cash and carry deal because a lot of the older boats, you're not going to get um, financing on them just because they're that old, or you're going to have to put a lot of money down. So you, if you've got the cash, you can get an older boat and get a really good price. So we found this boat. It was in, it's in fabulous condition. It does need some stuff for us to take it, um, you know, over the horizon, but now um, we got a good enough price on it. I felt that we won't have to spend, all of our waking time working on it. And uh, I know we'll, it's, it's an old boat, it'll still need work. But um, we've got a little bit of money left over to do some upgrades to it, to get it exactly the way we want to do it with. So, um, and right now we're in the process of doing that. Well, talk about, um, the, like, you looked at speed with boats and, and why. Boat or a nice, a little bit lighter. <clears throat> well, the, Speed of the boat, of course, I'm a, I'm a racer. So yeah, I want my boat to go as fast as I can get it to go. But, um, you know, I've never sailed a Morgan 44. So it, it's kind of a leap of faith buying a boat that you've never sailed. And to be honest with you, I still haven't even sailed this boat. <laughs> um, I haven't had it long enough to even take it out and Next pull week. the sails out. Next week, <laughs> Next I'm week. planning on sailing the boat. But right now, the first thing is to get it on the hard and get a bottom job put on it. And, uh, start that process but uh the uh, the keel depth it's a five foot keel which we found came in very handy going up this place called duck creek yeah it did. it's in new Bern, and um to get it to the marina where we had it pulled out of the water because i was looking at depths under six feet so i was near rubbing with a five foot keel of course it's probably a little bit more than five foot um but uh that's the spec on the boat. Um, I wanted nothing shorter than 40 foot, um, just for comfort. I'm going to live on this thing. And, and, uh, if I was, if I was going to be single handing, um, I, I definitely wouldn't have gone with a boat this big. Um, there's, there's many more smaller boats that would have been that fit would fit that bill. I think in the mid thirties range. But um, I think this boat will be fine for Pam and I if we're very careful with our uh, weather planning. Um, but uh, even then, we plan on for, for longer passage making. We all know people that want to go on a sail. So um, we're, we're open that that uh, holds true when we get out there in the blue water and, uh, you know, need people to come help us for a long passage. So, but uh, um, livability was well, a big yeah. I'm going to open it up if, for questions. So if anybody has questions, really, this is not on everything, just on determining the right boat or the right type of boat to buy. So you, we, we've got a couple of folks that have bought um, 
you know, blue water boats, I would, I would say the Morgan and, and Patrice's boat are blue water boats. We've got a couple that have got kind of the, the production coastal cruiser style, um, you know, and the Genoa, the Hunter, my boat, um, and then, you know, various degrees of performance from, um, you know, great blue water sailing in a catch to, um, you know, a boat that's that's pretty high performance, almost a race boat. Um, so if you guys have any questions at all on how we decided which style of boat to pick, type of boat, model, um, go ahead and ask now. Any questions? Yeah, I've got one if you guys can hear me. Yeah. Okay, so mostly I'm concerned with a blue water boat at this point, um, at, or potentially moving to a blue water boat. Uh, Bieber versus a stern uh, or a center cockpit boat. Um, I know that we've got a, a couple different uh, locations for the master suite that people have been mentioning. I'm just curious, uh, are you any concerned about having a V berth at the front versus a, uh, a stern master? You want to feel that, clear. Chris? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to let you go, Chris. Uh, <laughs> my boat actually has a Pullman berth in the front. Um, so haven't been out to, to, my only time I've been out to sea would be with Mike Lapari on his boat. Um, and I was in the aft cabin, <laughs> so I don't know. It'll be, you know, I, I don't know. What, that one? Yeah, I, I, um, we spent, um, probably six, five, six months on our boat, um, last summer. And there were some times at Anchorage that it was bouncing a little more than we would like in the V-Bird. And when that happened, we ended up um, sleeping in the salon, right in the middle of the boat, basically at the keel. Um, the v berth was actually the best if it was rolling side to side, but if it was up and down um, motion, then you wanted to be in the middle of the boat. If it was rolling side to side, because the V-Birth is the middle, is the most center um, yeah, it's where you see Jesus, yeah. Uh, it was fine. Um, I have heard, you know, the, the aft berths are a little bit easier at Anchorage. So I would, I would think part of your decision is how much time are you planning on being in a marina versus how much time at an Anchorage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So if you're, if you're going to keep your boat in a marina, I, I would not worry about making sure you have a nice aft cock, you know, an aft uh, cabin. If you're going to do a lot of uh, anchoring and primarily try to stay in anchorages, then an aft cabin is probably better, which means a center cockpit, which gives you that really big aft cabin with um, good headroom is important. Carl and Lisa, is your boat in aft cabin? Can you hear me? Yes. But our main state is the aft cabin because it's very tall. Um, okay. And it, I can say, you know, the advantages and disadvantages. We're, we're having a really hard time hearing you, Lisa. Can you, um, I don't know if you can speak up or into your microphone better. So, and we, Polish, where there's a lot, or a lot of swell, get a lot of it echoes to the point it doesn't bother me to just sleep carl will come in the salon we, we put the three chap off key on okay. yes, so so i saw the middle of the boat went down the uh, salon was fine and the center on offshore sales Yeah, we're losing you. Your call, 
know if the B quiet is the app, I think it is. Yeah, Carl and Lisa, we can't hear anything you're saying. Smaller. Sorry about that. Um, I know Chris. Can, can I add? Can I add? Can you hear me okay, Christian? Oh, yeah, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, um, so from what I understand, and, I, and this, is, this is all conjecture and, and from research, because I've not sailed this boat at all, but I know um, for, for livability, um, I think it will be comfortable at an anchorage, and the aft cabin in our boat is, is spacious, so it, it gives you a little bit of extra room to move around, and that's a, that's a real luxury when you're not underway. When you're underway, I understand that that aft cabin is not a luxury at all. I mean, there, nobody likes to be back there. Um, everybody gravitates towards the salon to do any passage making, um, bunking. Uh, I, the the V berth up front, um, it's it's a normal size V berth, and it's got a um, it's got an adjoining head to it. But um, the Morgan Forty Fours is actually got a very fine entry bow so it's it's pretty narrow at the feet on the v but because of the extra length of the boat i think it's it would be okay but um i uh, you know from you're you're going to make passages and you're going to do some sailing short passage making and long passage making it the either way the aft cabin really just take it out of the equation because you're not going to be back there Really what I got that boat for was the aft cabin at, when I'm at anchor or dockside or a uh, big thing, and I can't stress this enough, for me, more than the aft cabin, which I love the aft cabin, it's, a, it's fabulous, but I really like the big engine compartment because that's more fabulous -er. <laughs> <laughs> because I work on stuff. And I'm going to be working on this boat as soon as we leave the dock. I'm working on it the whole time. We're visiting it. And that's just it. So uh, you've probably heard the joke before that, that living on a sailboat is repairing a boat in exotic places. That's what it is. So, um, any, any other questions? Yeah, Jenny. Hey, Chris. I, you know, Clint's a boat broker and they do sea trials. Surely you went on a sea trial. You didn't get to sail it on a sea trial? I did not. I did not go on that sea trial. The boat was taken on a sea trial. Um, when I bought the boat, there was a survey and a sea trial done by the previous prospective buyer. But when that fell through, I made an offer to the previous buyer. Now the survey, will typically cost you about 800 to a thousand dollars depending on the size of the boat for my boat i think it was in her in the 900 dollar range plus about 400 dollars to have it pulled and bottom clean for them to do the out of the water inspection so roughly 1300 dollars for that survey and the uh and and taking it out of the water mm -hmm. and the sea trial so the the survey and sea trial was already done um, I was pretty confident and who knows, I might sail this boat next week and go, I'm selling it tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do that. But, um, I was pretty confident from what I read about the boat that of its seaworthiness and its sailability, everybody is very favorable in, um, talking about how well the boat sails. I was more interested in the condition of the boat. Um, every boat's got its idiosyncrasies and every boat's going to sail a little bit different. But um, I wasn't interested, I wasn't worried about not sailing the boat for the sea trial. I knew that it had been done and I knew that it had been done by a reputable um, uh, inspector. So I wasn't, I wasn't worried about that aspect of it. I Stop. think we're gonna um I'm not selling the boat. <laughs> I'm not selling the boat. <laughs> no. I think we're gonna try to move on to the next section, which we, we've covered a lot of this, which is it is kind of 
you know, in a process, you typically pick a type of boat or a style of boat you want, and maybe three or four different um, models, which is like what Chris did. And then once you do that, then you start hitting hard, looking at the each boat. So um, this section really is on what did you find in the boat you were looking for, not looking for. Um, you know, why did you pick this specific boat versus another Morgan 44 as an example, or another, uh, you know, Creelock 37? In my case, it was easy. I bought a brand new boat out of the factory. And you guys were laughing at Chris. I, I bought my boat without ever even seeing one before. I've only, I only read magazine articles, so that's really crazy. Um, but anybody want to talk a little bit about why you picked the boat you Aww. picked? Well, I, let's hear from you. Well, like I said, I, I mean, I did it more on the style of boat. So I had picked the, mm -hmm. I, I picked the boat, I mean, the style of boat I wanted, which was a, a fast cruiser. Uh, most important for me was I didn't want to do any work, so buying a new boat. And um, the boat I bought, and you'll see some pictures of the interior, it looks like. Now, this is a beautiful interior, I think, of the Creelock, is it? Oops. Yeah, that's my boat. Yeah, that's pretty. It's um, when you see mine, it looks like Ikea furniture. It's, it's very simple, very basic. Um, and, um, <laughs> you know, my boat new is about what some of these boats that are 10 to 15 year old boats that you guys are looking at. Mine's uh, pushing 40. <laughs> it was, a lot of it was based on the price for performance. How about anybody else? <clears throat> My boat is not a fast boat, but that wasn't my first priority. Right. I think I really was looking at safety. Um, I really, I don't know, there's just something that draws me to old classic boats. I just really, I like their look. I like their style. Um, it's not a super baby boat. Um, however, I think I learned... sevens did you look at? Uh, I looked at Three thirty sevens. Why are you laughing at me, Pam? I'm just laughing at. She when, won't quit laughing. What, she's got the giggles. When Chris sent her that boat, the very next day she's like, "I've already called him and talked to him about it." The next week she's like, "I'm going out to look at it," and then the next week she's like, "I'm buying it." <laughs> I bought it, but there were so Whereas Chris for two years would send me pictures and links. Two years, well, every single day, I would get a link from him going, look at this one, look at the, oh, this is the one, look at this one, look at this one, look at this one. But I have my list. Um, I really, okay, so I don't know who gave us the book, Chris, but I had known, like, I really have loved Pacific Sea Crab, like, that's been on my list. And I was like, Chris, I love tartans. I was like, oh, I want a tartan. Remember, I went through my tartan phase. I went through my tartan phase. Like, I want a tartan, I want a tartan, I want a tartan. And then I kind of got in the Pacific Sea Craft, and then... I don't know who got us the book, but Chris and I read this book by John Kreshmer, who if you haven't- You, you, you got it and you told me to it. read it. I gave it to you and then Pam bought us the second book. If you haven't read a book about offshore sailing, he really is just a phenomenal author. He, he's, he really writes some great stuff. He has a website that really will talk you through buying a boat and different. He's really all about blue water sailing boats and he has, a list of boats. He writes for a lot of the sailing magazines, so you'll find a, a lot of John Kreshmer stuff, but um, he just has some phenomenal books. I can't even remember the name, Sa Sailing a Serious Ocean. So if you're looking for a really good book about, you know, you're really wanting to take on this lifestyle and know that's what you want to do, it was, it was a book I read, um, and he really just goes through sailing through storms and different characteristics that you want in a boat, and this boat happened I had been looking like I said at a smaller Pacific sea craft but this boat happened to be on his list so when I started looking, I really thought oh I don't want a 37 that's too big for me um, I want something smaller but then when I found this um, I really feel like for me personally it ticked off all the boxes that I want um, I started digging into um, a lot of the safety requirements for a boat and different things that I really wanted and this I don't know like I said for me I like the canoe stern which a lot of people don't like um it's you know it doesn't have an open transom 
but I like that. Maybe Mike, after our 12 days together, I was like, please put enough stuff around me that I know I will never fall out of this boat. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, like I said, it's just, it's a preference thing for me. I liked having the canoe stern. I like having, um, the boat's not super beamy. I, for a 37 foot boat, I think my beam is just under 11 feet, which is, is for modern days, that's pretty small. But I feel it's got, um, I think my height is like six, four. So, um, and, and the Pullman berth is like seven feet. I mean, it's huge. So, I mean, I feel like you don't feel closed in on the boat, even though it's not super beamy. Um, but I think that adds to the safety when you're at sea, which is one of the things that um, I was really looking for. Just kind of the design of the galley. I liked how the galley was designed. I liked the layout of the boat. Um, I liked where the nav station was. Um, again, like Chris was saying, I doubt at sea I would ever be in the V-berth. Probably, you know, you'll be sleeping midship. So, um, and like I said, I just like it's it's teak inside. It's it's kind of got the old feel, which some people like and some people don't. I think that's just really a personal preference. So, yeah. So, Carl and Lisa, uh, I know you had had bought the Genoa Forty Two. How many of those did you look at, and did you look at two or three other boats as well before you picked your specific boat? I think Carl and Lisa have left us. Um, I think they had connection yeah. issues. Um, and just as a point of order here, uh, can you guys see the chat window? There is a chat window that exists. No, yeah. we don't know where that is. Um, if you um, hit the chat button, it'll pull it up. Yeah, click the bottom of the screen. There's a little thing called chat. Click that. And that should bring that up so that way you can see it. And that might, there's quite a bit of conversation. It might, uh, proceed moving these questions forward if you guys could all see that and they could type them in chat and you guys could answer them just point of order perfect and unfortunately because i'm sharing my screen i cannot get to the chat so okay if, let me get if, if any of the others if the any of the others want to um try to... i'm just scrolling through now they kind of use that oh wait a minute there it is Ah, oh, got it. I found the chat. Might keep people from stepping on each other vocally if we could just ask our questions in chat and you guys can answer. All right. Um, well, I think we're gonna because we're we're out of we're, we're running out of time quick. I'm gonna move fairly quickly through some of the next um, stuff. Um, I had I, I had mentioned my boat looks like IKEA furniture, so this is my boat. All of this is laminate like an Ikea. There's not a piece of real wood on the boat anywhere, I don't think. Um, but it's very simple to maintain because of that. Um, this, I think, is a uh, um, blends boat yep. um, with beautiful uh, storage um, and doors in his galley. Hmm. Fish dryer. So before we get off this, so th this section was not picking the type of boat so much as what happened when you looked at boats and you went and you saw four or five of the exact same boat. How did you pick which one you wanted? Um, are there any questions on that part? Whose is that with the, the top right with the map? Which boat is that? That one, yeah. I believe that's um, Lisa and Carl's. Janelle? No, that's Pam and Chris's. Pam and Chris's. Oh, Pam and Chris's. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you know the nav station's important, right? So are we mute? Are no, we we're not, not mute. So um, I will say this about Chris: when we would go look at a boat, he didn't hesitate. He was he was very um, polite. This rug up. Can I look in this? um section here can i look at the mask down at the bottom and and he brought a flashlight and he brought little mirrors and cameras and shit like that and he would go down in there and look and we get off the boat and he'd be like nope that's nope uh, i'll tell you um honestly um when you you got to go look at boats you've got to do your homework before you go look at the boat uh 
and and I'm, when I talk about doing your homework, really get into the numbers, know what kind of sailing that you would like to do, and and look for the boat that will accommodate that. Like Mike was looking for a very go fast boat, he wanted to do some Caribbean racing, and I thought about that for a long time, and I was looking at the same kind of boats, but then um, for the, uh, my desire just changed, so I went in a different direction. Um, and then started to look at some uh, passage. Books. I thought, oh, you know what? I would like to cross an ocean. Maybe I'd like to go spend a year in the Met or something like that. So I cannot stress enough, do your homework. And there's lots of, uh, there's lots of information. Um, sailboat data is, is a just gonna say that. really good starting point. Um, and take it from there and start. When you find a design that might interest you, just start digging into that. But I don't think anybody can um, can top the amount of of um, just digging for information research that <laughs> that Patrice has done. Because Patrice would I'd be talking about a boat, and man, I have looked at I've looked at so much data and so many boats, but she would throw a phrase out there and be like, well, what's the sticks rating on that? And I'm like, sticks? This is nothing about a, a rock band from the 70s. For crying out loud, what's the sticks rating? So then I'd have to go. Dan knows I'm the researcher. I'd have to go research <laughs> what a sticks rating is. But it's all very, very pertinent and useful information. Um, some of the older boats, um, a sticks rating is, is a stability rating for uh, mo mostly it's boats produced, I think, and what do you think, Patrice, the last 20 years? Yeah, um, so years? anyway, if you go to sailboat data, um, there's a whole section that will give you every piece of information that you need to find out, like your motion comfort rating, your AVS sticks rating, your, what is it? It won't always give you a sticks rating. Uh, well, it's your AVS, basically. Mm -hmm. So. Go to sailboat data and you find that set you'll find the section it's like your ratio what is it the sail to displacement ratio sail to displacement yep so if you go look at that section and you hit in the right hand corner it'll give you a description in the description it breaks each one of those categories down and it tells you what each of those numbers means so what you can do is if you're down to and this is what i did when i was down to about four boats that i was seriously looking at I took that data and plugged it in so that I could look at those boats side by side. So I could look at motion comfort. So how well the boat is going to handle in water? Is it going to be really rolly? Like what's the, what's the motion comfort of the boat? You can look at the stability of the boat. How well is the boat going to ride itself? So it's not only how long is it going to, how does it ride itself, but it's how much time does the boat take to ride itself is also factored into that AVS number. Stop laughing at me, fam. <laughs> but anyway, guys, I'm telling you what, everything she says is spot on, and it's excellent information. If when you if go you go to sailboat data, it tells you every one of those. You can take the boats that you're looking at, and you can lay that information out so that you're making a really informed decision based on what's important to you. So for me, safety was a really big factor for me. So when I laid boats out, those were the things that I was looking at. I wasn't as concerned for me personally and how fast the boat went, my boat's on the slow end, um, compared to probably Chris's boat and probably Glenn's boat, mine's older. Um, but like I said, it's probably higher on the safety end when it comes to uh, ABS or sticks rating or motion comfort. It's, got, it's higher in that end. So it's a give and take. It's just you laying that data out and going, okay, you know, what's the difference in the boats I'm looking at? What's the most important piece that I'm looking at? But sailboat data gives you almost everything laid out right in a row for you. So you can can really plug in all your boats and look at what you want to do. Yeah, you're right on with that. That gives you the data. And then, and then you can, you know, based on what you want to do with the boat, you can take that data and apply it Absolutely. to your choices. Absolutely. For Deb and I, we wanted to start out in the Chesapeake. I do want the ability to head up the coast and, and uh, hit Long Island, uh, Oyster Bay, and, and you know go back to some of my old stomping grounds, and uh, in the future head down the coast, down to the Caribbean. 
And uh, so we mm -hmm. chose a boat that is fully capable of handling uh, all of that coastal activity. Yeah, you could probably do a passage in it and that's fine, but uh, it's not the ideal boat for that. Um, yeah, you pick for your you needs. You so we, we chose for the need and for our desires and what we're gonna use it for. Um, and, and, you know, Debbie wanted an electric winch, so, you know, we... we <laughs> <laughs> she got her way. She got the electric one. Uh, but it's easy to handle. And, and that said, it's, it's also we chose it because it's going to be easy to handle for just the two of us. We're going to have plenty of adventures and bring members of the club out. And we're going to have some fun that way, too. But we also, just the two of us, will be out on that boat out in the Chesapeake. And so having the roller furler uh, main and, uh, you know, the, the layout of the cockpit is really easy to manage. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's really not that different than my 29.5 you know, in terms of the layout and ease of handling. Um, it's just bigger. Um, so it'll be something that we can certainly easily manage. Um, and, you know, the keel depth was another factor. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could get, we can't go everywhere we want to go because it, it, it's five foot, five foot uh, keel, but we can go a lot of the places that we want to go. So it's, it's, it's good in that respect as well. Uh, and that, went, that was part of the decision-making process as far as what boat we were looking at um, and, uh, and what features and, and size we, we wanted to look into. Absolutely. I know a lot of people when they look at boats that are easier to handle for shorthanded sailing, uh, they think either go smaller or um, less performance oriented, but um, you know, my boat and Glenn's boat have small non-overlapping jibs. Mm -hmm. um, and mine actually also has uh, boom in sheeting, so it's actually very, very easy. Glenn's is very easy. Yeah. And when you have boats that need a 155 or 135, it makes it harder. Um, Patrice's boat's another one, and it's a little bit hard because she has three sails, but all of the sails are much smaller by having a yawl. Is it a yawl or a catch? I can't uh it is a y'all y'all by having a y'all she ends up with the same sail area and three spread over three sails instead of two which makes all of the sheet loads a lot easier um so it's a lot easier for um people to handle um when you ha only have one or two on the boat and that's really critical i i personally think that may be the most critical thing in choosing the boat you choose because if you buy a boat that you and your wife can't handle together, it's not gonna be fun. Mm -hmm. But you and your <laughs> partner. Um. I guess. That's that's a very good statement. And also Absolutely. if if you're uh, if if you're coastal cruising and ducking in and out of um, coastal ports, there's a lot of bridges that will accommodate just so much mast height. Yeah. And if you have to get off of the ocean, um, the the shorter mast configurations are, a, are another consideration for that your your um either your yawl rigs or your your mizzen rigs so um, I say this, and i looked at those two across, but, <clears throat> you gotta cut across florida you need under 49. what what pam say all right patrice i said if you're if you're wanting to take the waterway across Lake Okeechobee, you have to have under 49 feet, or you have to have somebody tip your boat to get it through. So you I can't. Around, go in and out too. The, the, long, the deeper keel, we were wanting a canoe boat like what you have, but now in Florida and it goes, I mean, we don't want anything more than five feet deep on a draft. Yeah. So, so I the other I've part in selecting a boat I was going to ask is how many of you have looked at Practical Sailor and know what that is? Yes. Yeah. I have a subscription. So, <laughs> so Practical Sailor, especially for any boats over about 20 years old, will give reviews of all the old boats. And the most critical point is they tell you the um, weaknesses of the specific boat. Mm -hmm. So for example, it might tell you on the Creelock 37, um, the rudder, uh, look at the rudder head and rudder post to make sure it's not having problems. I don't know that that's a problem with your boat, Patrice. I'm just using that as an example. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it'll tell you, well, a good one is Catalina 30s. Um, the deck, the, the mass compression post, the little block under that tends to rot out over time because it's wooden and it sits in the bilge. 
Um, so it'll make sure you look at that. It's not a, a problem with really the boat. It, it just gives you things to make sure you look at on that specific boat so that you make sure you don't know exactly where the problem areas are and what to look for. And I think that's really critical if you're looking at specific boats over 20 years old. I think so too. I think I did read on, I read a ton on when I was looking at my boat, Pacific Sea Crab, just on the 37, what the problems were, what the great parts were. Um, and that's, again, John Kreshmer does the same thing. He rates a lot of blue water boats um, and gives, you know, the pluses and minuses and what, you know, pretty much any boat he rates, he's <laughs> for. it's not, you know, he's not just talking about it. He's actually raced, sailed those boats across oceans. He's a really, I think, a really wealth of knowledge on blue water sailboats. I'm going to um, actually skip a couple sections just because of time. Um, I think the, the next, instead of talking about how you negotiated for your boat and did the survey and all of that, um, I think talking about budgeting, um, not just the price of the boat, but the um, upgrades that you need to make immediately, the upgrades you want to make over time, um, mm -hmm. the um, general maintenance, all of those things I think have become real important. So let's jump into that um, and kind of talk through as you bought your boat, how much did you plan on putting in almost immediately to, to get it where you needed it? Uh, how much do you plan on putting in over the next three, two to three years? And then what's your general maintenance plan? Chris, you want to start? Um, when we bought Free Spirit 2, um, my primary concern with the, the whole cost of purchase was I, I wanted a good boat that had been well taken care of. And then anything that came after that, I didn't care about because I knew I would have to do it eventually anyway. Um, the sails are 10 year old sails. So my sails need replaced. I didn't I, I um, know. You get, I know a guy for that. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm going to take some measurements. Um, um, a, another thing a lot of people get hung up on is electronics. And personally, um, that is a very, I think electronics, uh, they evolve so rapidly and then become obsolete very quickly that I almost don't factor that in unless the electronics are absolutely brand new or within a couple of years on the boat. I'm just going to assume that everything on the boat is obsolete and I will have to replace it. But there's, there's a, there's, there's been some recent upgrades to electronics since 2000. And um, that's that, uh, I think it's NEMA. the NUMEA, the NUMEA NEMA, data NEMA, bus. NEMA, NEMA 2000. NEMA, NEMA. 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 Yeah, that's um, the network protocol. That's the way it communicates with all the different devices. And yes. I've been up and down that whole spectrum. Yeah, you do want all your gear to align with the higher speed protocol. Uh, more than if you company. have that on your boat that is a bonus but just because you have that doesn't mean you have new stuff nope. <laughs> because that's been around a little while but that is a that is a plus so you might want to put that in the plus column radar uh, it depends on electronics what you use on the boat um, AIS any of that stuff that's working is good but you're gonna find that you get on the boat and a lot of stuff is on the boat, but it's not necessarily working. So it's virtually useless. So do not even count it into the, the purchasing price. Um, and after that, I would budget probably 20 to 30%, maybe even more, depending on the condition of the boat before you're ready to take it um, out into open water, maybe over the horizon. I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, we, we figured right off the bat that we would probably easily put $30,000 into the boat before we go. It did not have a dinghy. It does have an outboard, but it's a small outboard. It is not big enough. 
if you're li if you're live aboard sailing in the Caribbean or any place else, um, I have a good friend of mine that had done that a lot. He said a, a minimum nine foot hypalong dinghy um, with a 15 horse outboard is what you want to have. You don't want to have anything less than that. Um, standing rigging. So um, you might have to replace the standing rigging, all of it on your boat if it hasn't been done in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so we have to look at that. Uh, I talked about the sails. Um, there's a, I would like to get an aft, uh, a, an aft deck arch or a stern arch for my, um, I don't know if you noticed in some of the pictures, my, I've got, um, uh, solar panels on the boat, but they are hung from a makeshift stanchion, uh, um, bracket that it just is horrible. It's a horrible place for them. But the people that owned the boat before I bought it, they had the mast down. And when they had it down, they completely repainted the mast, which is great. Mast and boom has been repainted. Big plus. But while the mast was off the boat, they took the boat on a, uh, a on the loop. So there was some reasons that the solar panels being where they're at was not a hindrance sailing the boat with those solar panels there is not even an option. So I have to find another way to mount the solar panels. So there's, there's electrical, you have to consider what kind of electrical you're gonna be when you're on the hook, fig your solar panels into it. I got an arch I gotta do. All of my canvas for my cockpit enclosure was rotten. Pam, try, Pam and I tried to put it on one night quickly and it was just so old I was punching holes through it and they they actually did not even include it in the description of the boat because it was in such bad shape so five thousand dollars later I'm getting a complete new cockpit enclosure made for the boat so that's that's part of the twenty to thirty thousand I want to get the, uh, an emergency life raft for the boat also that's three thousand dollars um, so, and, and that, a lot of it, of course, depends on what kind of lifestyle you have. We're, we're doing the, we're selling everything. We're getting rid of everything. Our life is going to exist on that boat for, I'm, minimum two years maximum is wide open, but we're selling everything and we're moving on to the boat and that's going to be our life for the next several years, so. Um, we want it to be as comfortable and as safe as we can make it. And we know that we're going to have to throw some money at it, even though it's a very well boat. So I thought Christian had a good question on the group chat about standing rigging. So um, <clears throat> figuring into the cost of the boat or buy a boat with good standing rigging. So Christian, I think, um, especially when you're looking at older boats, but really I think all of our boats are in the range where even a 2006, there's potential that at this point you're probably replacing standing rigging. My boat had standing rigging replaced about uh, nine years ago. So it's in, it's in good condition. It, it, when I did the survey, it came out in good condition. Um, however, knowing that maybe in another three, three to four years that I might want to take off for some extended cruise in this boat, I would definitely, I definitely budgeted in to replace standing rigging. That would not be something I would leave offshore without being replaced. Um, for me, right now, my immediate budget is about 10, 10 to 15,000 right now. I'm budgeting just immediately to put in, and that's, um, putting on new sails. Um, I'm replacing some running rigging on my boat. Uh, I had to replace actually, um, and this was negotiated within the contract, the fuel tank. So fuel tanks on a Pacific Sea craft are actually aluminum, not, um, and so mine had was original to the boat. It had a leak and had to be replaced. So I actually, um, I actually could not even use the boat the first couple of months. I had to have that pulled, refabricated, which I thought was going to be terribly expensive. Um, one of the things I've learned is going through the Pacific Seacraft factory is about three times more than anything else you could possibly do. So I actually found a local fabricator, had it done within a week, and it cost me about $700 versus the 
$2,600 that they wanted from the factory to have it built and it was gonna take like eight weeks. So, um, so anyway, that was budgeted in. Um, so like I said, right now I'm running at about probably 10, really a little under 15, about 12, I think to get the boat going right now, not, not forever going. Um, but that's, I bought a dinghy. I had a motor already. Same with Chris. My, I have a life raft, but it'll need to be um, either re, what do they call that? Repacked? Recertified. Recertified. But at this point, from what I'm reading and kind of finding out is that it's almost easier to replace it versus repack it. So um, you get into, it ends up being the same cost. So, um, I, we bought a brand new boat, so we didn't have to worry about, um, you know, things that had to be replaced, but we had no towels, no plates, none of that type of stuff, no life raft, no dinghy, and we actually spent close to $20,000 just buying all of the stuff that you have to have to live on a boat, whether that's silverware, plates, glasses, Pots and pans. I do have the ones Pam wants. <laughs> <laughs> Pam has. I got oh, them. The nesting pots. The nesting pots, yes. I got them. I've been using them here at home to practice. We've been nesting with them here at home. <laughs> okay. uh, but it, I mean, the virus yeah. helps for our nesting. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at a boat, look at all of that stuff because it's amazing how much um, it takes. Um, you you know you mentioned life rafts um you have to have them certified every two years and a six-man life raft is going to cost you about 18 to 1900 dollars and cost you about a 900 dollars to have recertified um so you know it's a it's a fairly high cost if you're going offshore at all and you want that um you don't want to leave home without it <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, glenn did you have things that you needed to do on your boat uh, we did. There's <laughs> one interesting discovery that we had when we did the survey and uh, sea trial is the uh, the bow thruster uh, didn't actually have the propeller on it. I guess um, something <laughs> managed its way in through there and it, it uh, sheared off. So that was one of the things that I don't have to replace. Uh, the former owner is replacing. Um, but there were a few things like that that, uh, that came up on the survey that were easily addressed. Um, and uh, Actually, all, all of the things that were on the survey that were an issue were, are being addressed by the former owner. Uh, we came in um, with knowing that we're going to be spending some time on the Chesapeake probably the next three years. So our, our plan is to spend uh, between um, you know eight and ten days at a time as we can, a couple of times a year, plus as many um, multiple-day weekends on our vacationing uh, out on the Chesapeake. So that is our, our current plan for the next few years. So we're still here, um, still have our house here. We're, we're actually you know, not making any uh, plans to go uh, live aboard per se in the, uh, in the immediate future. But what, we're, what I did wanna make sure was is that the boat was capable of, of doing more than that. So those, those expenses as far as the life raft and other offshore necessities won't be for a number of years down the road. So we got to put those expenses off for a bit. Uh, but yeah, when we uh, uh, when it's being pulled out, it, it you know it, there's there's a few things that will need to be done. New cutlass uh, bearing, uh, you know, a couple of things that are no big deal, but they got to get taken care of. Um, so the reason we chose this boat though was how well it was maintained for future for us in terms of um, budgeting. Uh, it, we're in a rather unique situation uh, because the uh, the boat is actually in a charter fleet. It's been in a charter fleet. And that charter is um, not a heavily used charter. We're not talking uh, moorings. We're talking about a you know there it, it may get chartered for uh, a few weeks out of the year and a, and a few three or four day uh, trips, um, and uh, that alone will offset a lot of the uh, annual cost of maintenance, slip, and uh, other expenses that we will have. Um, so that factored into our our long term budgeting for the boat as well. Um, in fact, uh, if if all goes well, it'll maybe even be a break even over the next few years, uh, which would be quite a blessing. But you know, can't count on that because it all depends on who charters it. So we'll we'll uh, we'll kind of see how that uh, how that evolves. 
Um, any questions on budgeting or uh, planning the budget? Um, financing. Oh, insurance. Yes, you have to have insurance. That's a very good question. Yeah. So, um, if if I don't, if you guys don't mind, if I'll lead off on that because I ran into a couple of pitfalls with the with the insurance stuff and what I found and everybody else recently has gotten insurance probably found this too, is that right now the insurance companies are very skittish about giving boat insurance for sailboats. And rightfully so. I mean, they've pretty much written off the Caribbean for an entire fleet for a season. So, um, <laughs> when, <clears throat> but when you, when you're, uh, so financing, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> No, so I mentioned financing um, older boats. What we're finding out is that if, if you're not putting cash down for these older boats, it's going to be very hard to get um, financing for older boats just because of the size of boat they are. And then it's going to be also a little bit difficult getting insurance. We ended up going with boat us Geico. They oh, yeah. made us jump through a whole bunch of hoops mm -hmm. before I could even, they wanted me to do a bunch of repairs to the boat before they would insurance and I'm insure it. And it's like, I don't even own the boat yet. So I've got to buy the boat and then it's not insured <laughs> until I get these other things fixed. So it feels like you're putting the cart before the horse. Um, there's there's one insurance company that I was almost to go with. They would not insure any boat south of the Georgia um, Florida border for the uh, hurricane months. So if you wanted to venture into that area and from May to December, you had to get a rider on your policy just to be there or your boat. Um, I, when I've got progressive for my boat here in Texas, um, they wouldn't, they would only insure half of my boat in North Carolina. And, and a lot of times it's the agent that you talk to. So that, um, really, really do your research on your insurance and find out what you need. But, um, one of the stipulations on my insurance was that, um, anything that was written up in my survey, and that was the big thing, they're going to ask you, you have to send them a survey. Mm -hmm. You're going to have your boat surveyed. Yeah. And this is your insurance company, not your finance company, your insurance company. They're going to say, send us the copy of the survey because they want to see what the, the surveyor found. And if there's anything unsafe, they're either going to want you to fix it or they're not going to insure it. And they gave me like four items on my, um, on my, off of my survey that I had to have fixed. So that was even before I pulled the trigger on the boat, that was just in the process of buying the boat. Um, so yeah, insurance is gonna be a big deal. If you're financing the boat, make sure you could get insurance for it. A lot of these older Christy, boats, a lot of these companies, they don't wanna insure these older boats. I've got a I've got a clause in my insurance policy that says anything that was in my survey that contributes to the loss of my boat or a claim is not covered. And there was a lot of stuff your surveyor is going to write up on that survey because you, the buyer, hired them to do that. But it's a two-edged sword <laughs> that's going to come back to bite you when you own the boat. You've got to get that stuff fixed. Or if your boat, did they give you a time period when you could get it done? They gave me, what is it? Because that's what ours said. We had Geico too through Boat US, and basically they, when they saw the survey too, they, it was like, are you going to fix this? Yes. Are you going to fix it in the next, you know, or when are you going to fix it now, in the next week, in the next month? And they worked with us, in, and we were in Florida, so, um, and, and they gave us that opportunity. How long know, ago was that said, that you got that? If I said, no, I'm not going to fix it, they probably wouldn't, yeah. but a year and a half yeah. ago. Yeah, how so how long they, ago was that that you got your policy? Because I believe John and Charlotte ran into the same thing with their Morgan 38. Yeah, eight, and I ran into 18, that. 18 months. 
18 months ago. So it changed ago. after last summer. So they, I ran into the same problem as Chris. So Boat US put us put me in kind of this loop of, well, we'll insure you, but you have to have yeah. every repair done before you buy the boat. And I'm like, well, I can't buy the boat. I can't oh, have, wow. it's, that's not going to work. I ended up not using Boat US because of that. I ended up going with someone else. Um, and meanwhile, another insurance broker told me that I guess, if, like, right, Chris bought his boat. I bought my boat all within probably, what, three, two, two months of each other. And they said that, yeah. I don't know if it was since that last hurricane, they just said they were really being particular. And yeah, that's too bad. Really with the older boats. They were just not wanting to. I had a difficult time. Yeah. Uh, finding insurance. I mean, I finally did, but it was not an easy process with an older boat. Um, I like Chris was saying with the financing, I, I was able mm -hmm. to pay cash for the boat. So that, that helped. Um, so I didn't right. have to about the financing piece. Um, and Chris brought up a good point too, about you have to get a rider. Like we, we most recently was right before we left to go to the Bahamas that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I delve in, Oh gosh, you know, I need to call them and tell them that, we're going um but that was a pretty easy easy deal you know they, it's x amount of money and you just pay it you know with that so um you know that's another thing that you know when people are looking for insurance you also need to make sure that you know your limits of where where your sailing limits where are. you can go yeah, yeah so my yeah. boat says yeah, Florida, they pretty much my dictate boat, that. My my boat boat in Florida as well yeah. and i plan on going to the bahamas and so i've already talked to my insurance about get you it was easy like uh, my broker just said, as, as soon as you know you're going to the Bahamas, then just call us and we'll add the rider on for Bahamas. Yeah. I think like right. Turks. Like, well, there's yeah, yeah. P. There was a clause in my um, in my policy, and it was the same for rider. Um, I know we're talking about riders. I'm not saying I'm not trying to mix everybody up. That was John Ryder, <laughs> but um, in his policy. And on mine, if your boat is damaged in a named storm, and I don't care if you're up in Iceland in the winter yeah. time, if your boat is damaged in a named storm for my policy, then your premium, I'm sorry, your deductible goes up. Deductible. It, was, it was about a yeah. 10, yeah. And so that, that, was a, that was a clause that they have thrown in. Mm -hmm. Didn't and back when we were purchasing insurance, that was the one thing that people kind of warned us, like, if you're going to call an insurance company and get this boat insured, do it now because there's not a named storm because the prices can differ when there yeah. is a named storm there. Yeah. Very good advice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, so what are you doing? Um, are you, so you live on your boat full time? Are you talking to me? Yes. Lisa? Lisa, yes. yes. Yes, we do. So yep, are you our... uh, coming back to Florida? So where do you, what, where, where do you kind of hunker down for hurricane? Season? Well, we, right now we're in the Bahamas, but when we travel up and down, so this last year we were in the Keys and, and in the winter time, and then we went up north. When we were up in Annapolis, that is when... Um, what storm was that that came? We were, in the, Long Island Sound we were in the Long Island Sound for Dorian. And, you know, we, we obviously we have the Waterway Explorer. We had all of our Navionics charts. And we had people that lived there that had local knowledge. So we basically just, um, you know, looked and asked everybody, you know, where do you know a good hurricane hole? And, you know, that was, that was very helpful because we were in an area where if we needed to, we could go further inland. Nice. We, yeah. Yes. That's what I, because I keep my boat in Florida, but I'm planning on moving it probably to Indian Town, maybe for hurricane season. Yeah. So our, our plan is always to, for hurricane season, to go north. Yeah. Um, you know, Chesapeake, Chesapeake Island. Long Island Sound, you know, lots of, there's, we've got friends that live in that area too. So like I said, we've got good local knowledge and of course using all of the um, available waterway guides, things like that. 
Boy, I wish I could re I, I wish I could recommend North Carolina because that's a little bit north, but man, they're still suffering the remnants of I think it's Florence. Was it Florence? A couple yeah. of years ago, ripped through there that and destroyed. Yeah, that was a hard thing when we were traveling up the ICW. You know, we were beautiful places we'd never I'd never been before, but it was amazing to me how you, you still saw places that were suffering from, like you said, uh, a hurricane, not the most recent one, but the one before that. Mm -hmm. So that was tough. Look, that's a picture of, oh, well, it was a picture of Chris in the um, engine room. <laughs> it's his favorite place to be. <laughs> that's, that's my comfort zone right there. In my happy place. My I do my zone. Zen exercises there. I do my mommy's in there. So since, since we're kind of heading into it already, um, why don't we, we kind of close out with uh, finding your uh, forever home or where you're going to store it. And um, definitely if you're on the East Coast, um, book even the Caribbean. When I was going to bring my boat to the Caribbean, it was going to go south during hurricane season, down to Grenada or, or St. Martin. Or yeah. farther south than that, and come up to the BVIs uh, during the non hurricane. But um, that's a lot of great um, discussion on where do you store it um, and, and what's that mean. So, um, anybody want to jump in from where you guys left off? Well, like, obviously, uh, it's a lot easier when you live aboard because you basically just get in the boat and go. Um, for yes. people that don't don't live aboard, then, you know, I, I'm curious, what do you, how do you plan to store it outside, you know, out of state, on the hard, in a marina? So I, my boat's in Stewart, Florida, which is just north of West Palm. Um, and so I already have a, my, my kind of hurricane hole will be Indian Town, which is up near Lake Okeechobee. Um, and it's pretty well protected. A lot of people keep their boats there um, <clears throat> because I don't live aboard, so I have to have a way to to keep it. Um, and I'll probably put the boat, I'm hoping, you know, right now everything's kind of messed up. I was hoping to maybe early summer be able to do a little, maybe cruise over to the Bahamas, do a little sailing, and then early July put the boat on the hard through hurricane season. So that was, that's my plan. Pam and Chris, you guys are probably tucked away pretty well where you are. You know what? We kind of we kind of fell into this where we're at. Of course, the boat was there when we bought it, and I've never even been to North Carolina. Well, I think I have once before, but never spent any time there. Uh, we're in New Bern. It's it's one word. It's New Bern. So I, I keep trying to use two words, but they pronounce it as one word, New Bern. So uh, we're in New Bern, and um, we're in a, a small marina. Hi, how many boats do you think are there? Hundred, maybe. Yeah, roughly maybe. that. It's a, it's actually it's a nice small homespun marina. I guess would be the best description for it. Mm -hmm. um, at, when we first bought the boat, we're like, okay, we're going to keep it here for a few months and then try to move it to Jacksonville, Florida because that would be a good jumping off point for us and a good way that American flies easy, directly easy to Jacksonville for VFW. But we're finding out that it, it's easy to get good work done in New Bern. I, and I mean quality work done for your boat, on your boat. And by, um, you know, they've got a good marine industry there and it just seems like everything is very well done and it's not very expensive. To give you an example at this marina that we are in, a month ago, we put our boat, or it wasn't, it was less than a month ago, but it was like the first week of March, we put our boat um, on the hard to get the bottom done. And I went in to tell the marina management where we were at, hey, we're, we're not gonna be in our slip, but I think we're gonna do another three month lease. So don't give our slip away. Okay, well, if you're not gonna be here the whole month of March, and we already paid, by the way, we paid for our slip um, from January to the end of March. 
she says, well, if you're not going to be in your slip, we'll just prorate you the days that you're not in your slip. And we were like, really? Who does that? <laughs> who, who does that? <laughs> I'm here. So I, had to pinch, I had to pinch myself, but um, they're sincere about it. So um, my slip is there for me when I come out of the, off of the hard. Um, I'm just right up the river where I had the boat pulled. And uh, they're like, yeah, give us a call when you bring your boat back. We'll help you tie up. And by the way, while the boat's there, their dock crews, because that the boat, the, the docks do not rise or fall. They are fixed docks. So the, the marina crew comes out and adjusts everybody's dock lines depending on the, the water depth. So if the water depth goes way down and the lines are straining, they'll come out and ease your lines. If it's way up, they'll do the same. So they'll like keep your boat fresh. of the dock. It's yeah. just, it, it's so, just, so we're staying where we're at because of economical reasons. They're, the work there is so well done and the people there are so nice and it's very affordable. So that's part of budgeting. I, I would say that the, the fixed docks was a big deal for us at the beginning, but now it's, it's really not. There's a huge trust in the marina people. Um, so yeah, just, yeah. The, the customer service there is bar none. It's awesome. So, Glenn, I know I noticed your marina has a travel lift. Um, does it allow you to work on a boat um, in the yard? So the answer is yes. They do allow you to work on the boat in the yard. Um, it is a full full service marina. They do uh, have just about everything you could possibly imagine uh, authorized Yanmar dealership uh, you know but um yeah it's it's and they do pull the boat out you uh you you know you pay a a set fee to have the boat pulled out put on the hard and then when you know spring comes along they put it back in uh which is pretty much standard op but um yeah this uh so we were able to look at the boat though because it was for sale it stayed in the slip through the winter um and they even have bubblers around the boats in case the, the, the water freezes over. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a pretty comprehensive marina in that respect. Rock Hall, um, Maryland, it's not far out from Annapolis. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, and it's kind of interesting because where the original, that Sparks and Stevens boat that I was looking at originally, it, it was down in uh, uh, Virginia, I can't remember the name of the marina, but it was one of the marinas that I think uh, Carl and Lisa had pulled into. Um, right, I uh, can't remember the name of it, but Carl and uh, Lisa. Delta, it was in Deltaville. Deltaville is where Deltaville? it was. Deltaville? Yes. Yeah, we were hauled out in Deltaville. Yeah, your boat might have been right near this thing. <laughs> and we had to, we, had, we actually stayed on the boat for a period of time too while we were hauled out. That was a, that was interesting, challenging and interesting. I bet. <laughs> yeah, they let they let us do a lot of our own work, which was great. Right. And it was a really inexpensive place to haul out. Um, a lot of good people that we met there, though. They did a you know they did a really good job, and we were happily surprised by the bill at the end. So excellent. Um, yeah. it, it is it is critical when you're looking for a place if you want to do work on your own boat um, to find out yes. whether they allow it on the hard. Yep. And the other nice thing was they also had a, they also had a list that they had their own hurricane plan. And while we were there working on the boat, you know, you could put your name on the list. And, you know, there were times when in bad weather came through, they went and they hauled every single one of those boats out of the water and put them on the hard. So they had a great hurricane plan. They had great people. Um, uh, the only bad thing about Delta is, there's no, no um two hours from, airport. Two hours from any airport yeah. and uh very small but it, but like i said the people were great and it was it's beautiful there and they treated us well yeah so it was a gorgeous area really it's nice interesting really where i have my boat um they don't allow you to store a boat on the hard because the winds are so high that boats they've, they've had more damage from boats falling off Huh. Oh, geez. They don't have damage with the boats in the water. So they don't have yeah. any onshore storage in the Canary Islands right now. Huh. Yeah. But that was one thing that we were very particular about when we were hauling the boat out was, as Mike said, to you need to check with them. Do you let you know us do our own work on the boat while we're in the yard? 
Yeah, there's actually a list at Rock Hall as well. We ended up, uh, Haven Harbor has a hurricane list. And uh, actually, while I was in the, uh, be before I even closed on the boat, um, I was chatting with the marina manager. Oh, would you like to be on the hurricane list? Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. What is the hurricane list? So there's a list of boats in a marina that will automatically be pulled out uh, in case a hurricane is predicted to come across the uh, across the marina. So they'll well, they actually. If you're in Texas. No, no. This is this is 